this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about wave particle duality. Wave particle duality is a central idea in quantum, which is that all things can show wave behaviors or particle behaviors. It depends on what they're doing and how we observe them. It's all started with this question, which has puzzled scientists for a long time. Is light a wave or a particle? This is Guerrilla Physics. Other channels to cover the content, but I'm going to show you how to get the A star. Most of the time when you first come across quantum physics, you'll come across this question, is light a wave or a particle? And it seems pretty obvious at first because you're used to discussing light as a wave. And there's a lot of evidence which would support that theory. And for a long time, that theory did prevail. Isaac Newton himself, though, did not think that light was a wave. He thought that it was actually a particle. He thought it was a particle, which he called a corpuscle. And this model was like really limited though. Scientists knew at the time and there was a lot of arguments. There was a discussion between him and Robert Hooke, who was the same guy from Hooke's Law, but also invented the compound microscope. There was a lot of conversations between him and there were documented letters about them discussing this question, is light a wave or a particle? And they disagreed. See, calling light a particle works well for something like reflection. We know reflection is a property that light has and that works if it's a particle. That evidence is fine with the model of light as a particle. At a similar time, Christian Huygens was doing his work on what we call Huygens construction. And it's a really important principle in waves. Huygens construction is just the idea that a wave front can be thought of as individual circular wavelets, which are all constructively interfering to make wave fronts. There's a debate if you think about waves on the ocean that appear as these parallel lines and waves if you start a ripple in a pond which go out radially, which are circular in form. Were those two things the same thing? And Huygens construction just basically made that make sense to people that actually they were the same thing. It's just that all those circular wavelets were actually combining to make those wave fronts. But importantly, wave fronts could be shown to do refraction. But when they refracted, what happened was they slowed down. Newton explained refraction with light being a particle, and that worked as well, but it meant that particle would have to speed up to do that refraction. So it could be demonstrated that light could be refracted, but the model didn't fit very well with both the particle theory and the wave theory. So the debate continued. The debate continued until Thomas Young did his famous double slit experiment and he showed that light could actually interfere. He showed that when you passed monochromatic light through a pair of slits, they diffracted and they interfered and they produced an interference pattern, something which we knew waves could do. So the wave nature of light seemed pretty convincing at this point. If you try it with light going through two holes and then meeting and interacting, you get the same effect. You see those light and dark bands? Interfering waves of light. But the debate continues. And there's a really important piece of evidence called the photoelectric effect. Now, I have a full video on the photoelectric effect, so I'm just talking about the photoelectric effect in this debate at the minute here. It's basically the emission of electrons from metal surfaces due to light. So we have charged metals and we have light, which gives those electrons enough energy to escape that charged metal plate. So at first glance, there's nothing that doesn't work with a wave theory or a particle theory here, but there's one key piece of evidence here. This doesn't happen with light below a certain frequency. Only light above a certain frequency actually does this effect. So the photoelectric effect is the effect that we have to have light above a certain threshold frequency to cause this. Only works with light which has a high enough energy. It only works with light which has a high enough frequency. There's a really key idea. This doesn't work with low frequency light. Above a certain frequency, we start to get these photoelectrons emitted, but below that frequency, we don't. So that does not work with our theory of light as a wave because waves transfer their energy continuously. So in theory, if light was a wave, we'd have this continuous transfer to the electrons and eventually they'd have enough energy to escape the metal. It doesn't happen. It only happens if we have the light above a certain frequency. You see, light definitely has a frequency, but we can definitely show that it acts as discrete packets of waves. And we call those discrete packets photons. So this is the idea that light is both a wave and a particle, but it's also the idea that evidence changes models. Models have to agree with the evidence that we have, otherwise we reject them and we change them. 
And the most key bits of evidence that we'll talk about in this video are the Young's double slit experiment, where light could be shown to interfere, and that's only a wave behavior. And the second bit of key evidence is the photoelectric effect, where light can be shown to behave as a particle. It acts as discrete packets of waves. Photons. There's this issue, and this is the birth of quantum physics, essentially, because we have this idea then that there needs to be a certain energy in one packet of light, one piece of light. There needs to be enough energy for one photon to cause one photoelectron to happen. So Einstein solved this puzzle in 1905. He gave us Einstein's photoelectric equation, one of the most important bits of physics ever. And that essentially is this, HF, which is the energy of a photon, that's the Planck's constant times by the frequency of the photon, equals the work function, which is the minimum energy required to remove an electron from that charged metal plate, plus the maximum kinetic energy of any of those photoelectrons. Now again, I have a full video where I explain this and I show you the, the experiment, which is called the photocell experiment. And I go into detail about the evidence for this and threshold frequencies and how you plot that as a graph and everything like that. So don't worry too much about that. But the key point here is that this needs to be the case. The energy of the photon needs to be above the work function for this to happen. So this essentially means that we have evidence now that one photon, one packet, one discrete unit of light is interacting with one electron. Because we don't get that continuous behavior, we now can say that it is not simply wave behavior that light shows. Light does have some wave properties though, of course, because we are talking about the frequency of it. So we have this idea of wave particle duality. Light is both a wave and a particle. It's a photon. It's a wave particle. It's a light particle, a photon. So quantum mechanics is an incredibly successful model which started from this. It was the most successful model of the 20th century and loads and loads and loads of things really were explained by quantum mechanics. The idea that we can actually quantize just about anything. We can work out a small unit of energy, a quantum of energy, the smallest, the fundamental unit of energy. Things like charge started to be quantized. So Robert Millikan worked out that electronic charge could be quantized. What we found out was that there are elementary units of charge, that nature provides grains of charge all the same size. Now Redfield put some charge on the plates, and some of those particles are charged. You can see they're pulled up by the electric force. Right now, the sphere's in balance. That means that the electric force upward is just equal, although in the opposite direction from the, elect the gravitational force downward, like this. Electric force and gravitational force. And I'll make another video about Robert Millikan's experiment and how he worked out that the electronic charge was 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Essentially that charge always comes in these same units of charge. You don't get randomly 2.6 times 10 to the minus 19. You only have multiples of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. You only have multiples of the electronic charge. And that's a fundamental property of charge that we can't change. That's a quantum of charge. But it gets more confusing than that because it turns out that just about everything has wave particle properties, wave particle duality. So actually Louis de Broglie hypothesized that all particles, all matter could be thought of as of having both wave and particle properties. Essentially, depending on whatever the situation was, they behaved like a wave or they behaved like a particle. Depending sometimes on just how we observe them, they either show wave properties or particle properties. And Louis de Broglie's experiment actually showed that electrons could be diffracted and that they would diffract and they would actually have a wavelength as they behaved like waves. So we have this thing called the de Broglie wavelength. And again, that was related by this universal constant that Max Planck had come up with, the Planck constant, H. So we can work out the de Broglie wavelength of a wave particle as being the Planck constant over its momentum. H is Planck's constant, which you're always going to have in a data sheet in A-level physics, 
and P is the momentum of the electron. Now this has real uses. Because electrons can be diffracted, we can now use an electron microscope. So electron microscopes actually analyze the diffraction patterns of electrons and they can build up astonishingly high resolution images of this, this is a dust mite, of very, very, very small things. Even down to the atomic scale, we can use this wave particle properties and down to the atomic scale, we can take electron microscope images of incredibly high resolution, much higher than would be ever possible with light microscopes. And actually, Louis de Brut, <laughs> I almost said de Broglie, <laughs> I almost said de Broglie there. Louis, <laughs> Louis de Broglie. <laughs> The two key bits of evidence are Young's double slit experiment, which is evidence for wave behavior of light, and the photoelectric effect, which is evidence for a particle nature of light. It does both of these things, so we say it is both of these things. This is really the birth of quantum physics, where light could be shown to be quantized. In other words, it acts as individual discrete packets, individual particles of light. Quantum physics was expanded and it managed to explain a lot of evidence, and that made it the most successful model in 20th century physics. Baseball don't show wave properties. Water waves don't act like particles. Nothing that we've discussed acts like particles and waves at the same time. But light can and does. All the experiments that have been performed show it. With dark bands where they cancel. This is a typical wave phenomenon. From the geometry of this arrangement, we can calculate the wavelength. You've done it yourself in the lab. If I move this double slit, the interference pattern moves. There's a minimum, we find none. With this description of light, we are able to predict its behavior, and for the moment, that means we understand it. Thanks a lot for watching, I hope that was useful. Check out the rest of my videos on A-Level Physics, and don't forget to subscribe and check out gorillaphysics.com for all my videos organized by topic. I hope that was useful, don't forget to subscribe, like this video, and leave a comment if you've got any more questions below.